Hey everybody, welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. We are here with Heidi Baker. We're going to discuss her life, her ministry. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this program. We are going to be discussing, man, just the impactful ministry of Heidi Baker, uh, what's going on in Mozambique, Africa, uh, the ministry that she has been uh, uh, performing with, with orphans and caring for uh, the poor and, and sick. Uh, she's got a powerful ministry, a lot that we can learn from her today. But before we dive into the subject, I want to remind you, Rendit Radio is entirely crowdfunded. So the best way to support the ministry is subscribe to the channel, like the video, and, and maybe even uh, keep following up with us in the uh, newsletter. It, there's one link found in the description. You have different ways that you can connect with us. Uh, best way is to connect there in the newsletter and find all the different ways that, that you know, you can support the channel and all the different activities that we're doing. Uh, that's the best way to get in contact with us and stay in contact with us. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to my co-host. Uh, it's Michael Roundtree on the right and Heidi Baker there on the left. Super excited to have you on the show today, uh, Heidi. Uh, Michael, this is... Th have you you've met Heidi once before? We met her at the Send, is that right? Yeah, I met her at the Send, and uh, first met her in Scotland on a ministry trip like 15 years ago, and uh, was ministering with Jack Deer, and so met her there, and again at, at the Send. And Heidi, I've read your books and uh, watched you preach and all kinds of things, and really blessed by your ministry, super challenged and inspired. Uh, by your life. And so we're grateful to have you on uh, from Mozambique. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, and Heidi, we're just going to jump right in. Maybe for uh, anyone who's not familiar with you or your ministry, could you just uh, introduce us to what you do in Mozambique? Um, yeah, well, my, my ministry is I'm first a lover of Jesus. I spend a lot of time in his presence. Um, I'm a little mama um, with a very big team. Uh, I love the Lord more than anything I can think of. I love being with them. I love praying and worshiping. Um, founder, co-founder of Iris Global, which is a mission movement um, working in uh, 38 countries and 73 bases around the world. And I travel about a third of my life. Um, ministering all over the world in conferences and and uh, churches and things just founded a university um, very excited about that uh, in Cabo Delgado Mozambique where I've been why I was a little late running to this uh, meeting we just got our approval from the government it was on national television last week so Iris University is born and um, that's been a really a big process, 20 year process. And I just, I love, I love uh, ministering with my team, sharing the gospel um, where people just have never heard or whether they're a very unreached area. Um, I love it. That's just my passion. I love sharing the gospel. I love seeing water wells go in and, and I love seeing orphans being cared for in homes, widows being cared for. Um, the underserved being served. And so in short, we are a movement empowered by the love of God to stop for the one in need. And Amen. we do that in many ways. That's well, who we are. In, congratulations in on the university. That's super cool. Thank I, that's, you. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's no small feat. So congratulations on that. I mean, I, uh, I hope... It's a big thing. Yeah, I hope in this interview we can kind of just talk a little bit about you and your life and how all this got started. Uh, maybe just start off, uh, you know, give us a brief sketch of early Christian life and then how you were kind of called into the missions uh, space and, and what drew you into that. Oh, yeah. I Well, I was the first um, person. You know, I'd love to see you while I'm talking, so it would really help me. But I was the first person um, in my family that, that was what some people would call born again. I'd never heard um, the gospel before. Uh, and I was on an Indian reservation in central Mississippi. 
and I heard a powerful message by a full-blooded Navajo preacher who was um, a Baptist, and he just shared the gospel. I'd never heard the gospel before, and I was undone by, by the fact that I needed to know Jesus in a personal way, and I was this little ballerina. I grew up in Laguna. I was a surfer, a ballerina, I raced motocross, and um, was really into skiing and diving and surfing and ballet. And I just liked going fast. Um, so I don't know. I didn't know that I was such. Um, I was so in need of salvation. I just didn't understand. But when I heard that Navajo preaching about 500 Indians and me, uh, I was convicted. I knew I needed a savior. And they were about, I don't know, they, they sang just as I am nine times and nobody went. Uh, and I finally just felt compelled to go forward. And I was powerfully born again. And I remember this lady just shushing me. She just, she said, shush. And I said, no, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And I knew I needed to be born again. And that's how it happened. March 13th, uh, 1976, March 14th, 1976. Uh, these other, another group um, called Pentecostals, they invited me to their uh, congregation. And it was like being on the moon. Like, I don't know, there were about 30 people there. And they were like, you must be baptized, you must be baptized in the holy ghost and i'm like what's baptized in the holy ghost the last day they said you must go to a revival and i didn't know what a revival was i didn't know what baptized in the holy ghost strong southern accents i'm from california i'm from a, i'm a laguna girl i don't understand these people like what's baptized and they locked me in a rusty old car and drove me to their church. I don't think they'd had a new person there in probably 20, 30 years. I don't know. I walked in. It was like, whoa, the women had on long dresses. The men had super short hair when long hair was in at that time. And I was like, oh, no. You know, I was wearing my brown jeans and a short top. And the pastor's like looking at me and preaching. You must be baptized. And then he said, and you're going to be baptized and then you're going to speak in tongues. And then he's sha -la 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 pro praying. And I, I'm just like, whoa, I don't know what's happening, but I feel compelled to go forward again. Second night in a row. I went forward. Um, I, all I can tell you is I had an experience with, with God. Uh, I really did. I, I was, absolutely undone. Uh, I had never experienced anything like this in my life. Um, I actually fell down under what they would call the power of Holy Spirit. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what any of it was. I began to pray in other tongues, other heavenly languages, um, and joy hit me, like this incredible joy. And then they said to me, here's, I'm just laughing. They said, you must be baptized in water. And I'm thinking, oh no, I know my, my mom, she did something when I was a baby, you know, I, I know I'm going to be in trouble. And they're like filled up their bathtub. They, they said, you must be baptized now. And, and they literally gave me a white dress and they, they kept me under a bit to wash off the mascara, because they didn't believe in any mascara. They, they're they like, washing off the mascara, put me in the white dress. I came out of that water, I'm telling you, I, I was so in love with Jesus, so in love with Jesus, so absolutely undone by the power of the Spirit, that I've never, ever been the same. That is how I was initiated. I was powerfully born again. And a few months later, I had another encounter with God uh, that where I was called into missions and into um, ministry. That's okay. how it started. Huh. Well, we would like to hear about that next encounter with God and calling into missions. Could you tell us about that? 
Yes, leave. Oh, if you leave your cell phone, I would be so much happier. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Heidi. I've I've got no way of keeping yeah, the. Really Josh, you put it on like the three the screen where it shows no, no, all of us. No, no, I, I love she to see the... you guys. I don't really want to look at myself. Um, <laughs> Here we are. Yeah, okay. Better. Thank you. Thank you. That helps me a lot. Thanks, guys. You're good sports. Um, so what happened? Um, I was severely, severely dyslexic. So uh, I could memorize things. That's how I got through school, how I became an American field service student, ended up as an exchange student, been in Switzerland for a year. I was a ballerina. So I mean, I was I could do pirouettes and leap across the stage but I could not read. And I was very, um, I, I mean, it would take me forever to get through a page. My head would just ache. I was in so much agony and I was frustrated, um, angry. I knew I wasn't stupid, but I felt stupid. I was put in the dummy classes, but I figured, well, I can dance. You know, I can't read, but I can dance. And I really, that I was, that I could do. But the pastor, I remember the pastor of that church, I finally just, they handed me a big black Bible and it was like useless to me because how was I going to read it? How, and I didn't want to tell him I couldn't read, but I knew enough to know I needed to know what was in that book. I needed to know the, I needed to know the word of God. And they told me I needed to fast and pray and know the word of God. They hand me this book, but I can't get through it. And so I just admitted to this pastor, this brother, Roark was his name. And he said, no problem. We've got tapes. That tells you how old I am. We got tapes. And they gave me a, a cassettes of the New Testament. And I literally wore that thing out. I listened to the Bible for hours and hours a day. And I started to memorize the word. And it just went inside of me. And um, I'll tell you the second part of that encounter. And then I'll tell you how I got healed, um, miraculously healed by the Lord from dyslexia. So I, I um, was fasting and praying. And I was in the word night and day. Uh, I went to church six days a week. I just, I couldn't get enough of of the presence of God, of, of his word, of just being with him. You know, I was so excited. I didn't want to do anything else. And just, just to be with him and just to learn about his word and be in his presence. And I was on the fifth day of a fast. Um, and I remember the, this is a very loud church, very small church, very loud. I think they had two pianos and they were just banging away and the preacher's loud. The pianos are loud. This is not uh, a quiet place. And I'm on my knees and I'm just worshiping the Lord. And suddenly I could not hear the preacher. Uh, suddenly I couldn't hear the pianos. I couldn't hear them. Um, my hands were lifted, my eyes were closed, and I was just taken into an encounter, an encounter that changed my life and marked me um, forever. So I was born again, filled with the spirit, still dyslexic. I'm now in this encounter with God. and. I'm in this time where, where I can literally, and I, I've been preaching this glorious gospel for a whole long time now, since I was 16 years old. But um, I didn't know that that was possible. For one thing, I didn't know a woman could ever, you know, share the gospel. I'd never seen that. Um, I'd never heard of that. And, and I'm on my knees, my hands lifted, and I hear one time, I've only heard the audible voice of God one time in my whole life. I've heard his internal voice many times. I know you can hear him in the word, but to hear an external audible voice of God, it happened once in my entire life. And it was that day in May. Um, it just makes me just, um, I'm so grateful, you know, because it's such a sovereign thing. 
uh, I didn't choose what I'm doing. I didn't like make it up. I heard the Lord call me to be a minister and a missionary to go to Africa, Asia, and England. And later he called me to the world, but I felt like this kiss of the Lord Jesus on my left hand. He said, you're to be married to me. And all of us are married to him. You know that as lovers of Jesus, we're all called to be the bride. But I didn't understand any of that theologically. I just knew that my heart literally stopped, that he won my heart. That's all I can say. He won totally my heart and I gave him every single thing. And I, I have, um, I've wanted to quit missions at times. I have never, um, I have never denied what, what my Lord and my Savior and my King uh, did that day when he called me. And I've been preaching ever since. I never thought I'd be invited into a church. Um, I started preaching in, on the streets and Alzheimer's homes and drug, drug dens. And I still preach on the streets, um, in the bush. I sit in the dirt and share without microphones. People don't see my real life out here. Um, but I still, most, most of the time when I share the gospel, I, I literally am sitting in the dirt two, three days a week with people sharing this glorious gospel. And um, he's just won mm -hmm. my heart. I'm in love. That's why I'm in love. Yeah. Heidi, l let me ask uh, the question of, of what that looked like. I mean, you, you said England, Europe, and Africa. Now I'm, no, if, Africa, I, if my recollection, Asia, yeah. Africa, okay, so if, Asia, Africa, Asia, England. Now, if my recollection serves me correct, you've got like a, like a theology degree in England, right? I our, am I crazy? I have a PhD in systematic theology from King's College, University of London. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. So, so how did, how did that whole journey go? I mean, you've got a theological education, you've got this, this background in missions to, you know, these three corners of the earth that are kind of quite, quite spread out. Um, you know, you, you got married to Roland somewhere, uh, 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 on this, on this journey. Uh, maybe just walk us through some of that. Okay. Well, yeah, it is pretty wild journey. My parents thought I was crazy. Um, they they absolutely thought I was crazy. They said they'd get a psychologist to deprogram me. Um, they said I was in a cult because I I um, prayed in tongues. My dad was um, Jewish, Catholic, atheist. Um, my mom was um, kind of Episcopalian, but she had a lot of problem with passengers. Some people call them demons. You know, she had a uh, psychological problems. Uh, so, so my family was very upset. They were Ivy League Bohemians. They were very upset with with me, and they wanted me to leave the Indian reservation where I was an exchange student. I said no. They're like, you're so crazy. We're gonna get you help. We're gonna get you deprogrammed. And you know, they had they had a lot of resources, financial resources. They had a lot of education. They were very upset. And um, I said no. You said we don't quit. Um, my maiden name's Farrell. They said no. I said no. Farrells don't quit. I'm not quitting. I'm finishing. And I I just got very deep, deeply um, discipled really in the word of God. And I was healed. I can't remember the exact day of the healing, but God touched my brain supernaturally, rewired it. And my brain was healed. I could, um, the day I was healed in a healing meeting, which I'd never heard of either, I opened my prop. Um, I carried the big black Bible they gave me as a prop and um, didn't want people to know my secret, just a few people knew. And I remember after they prayed for me, I opened it and I could actually decipher the letters. Like it didn't hurt my brain. I could actually understand the letters and I could see them clearly and they 
made sense to me. And I suddenly um, just had this supernatural healing with my brain. He, he rewired it. And so that was a point my parents couldn't deny. Um, but I, I think because of that severe problem, I had probably the worst SAT scores in California besides someone that didn't speak English. I mean, there was no way I was getting into college or they said, don't even try vocational school. Don't even try. You know, you're just too, you're just too low on the spectrum here. You can't do it. And I said, no, I can now. I can now. And there was this Assemblies of God University, SCC, Vanguard. And they took a chance on me with those horrific um, scores. I just told them my experience with God and that he healed my brain and that now I could read. And I know I couldn't answer those questions on that SAT, but now I could read. And I was called to be a minister and a missionary. And so these, these guys just took a chance and they admitted me. And my parents, you know, they says, if it's accredited, we'll pay for it. You know, they didn't believe anything Christian could be accredited. But they, they, um, they said, okay, you know, go for it. And I ended up getting my, my bachelor's in three years. And um, then I was in Mexico City and I heard the Lord really internal tell me seven things. One of them was Mary Roland Baker that was thrown in the middle. And I was like, whoa, um, whew. My first thought is he's quite, he's really old. You know, he's quite a bit older than me. Like he's old and he's, he's kind of, whoo, he's so serious. And I had these thoughts and anyway, long story short, the Lord, we know the Lord knows what he's doing. And uh, we went to lunch once, Roland and I, Chinese lunch. He's the one, I married into the generational blessing. He's fourth generation missionary. Um, his, he was born in China. That kind of gives you his age, right? He was born in mainland China as a missionary child before the whole thing uh, blew up. And... He, he is just the man God picked for me. It's amazing. We've been married 43 years now. We got married. Uh, when we got married, I got ordained. I graduated university. Uh, and we went to the mission field all in the same month with a one-way ticket in $30. Uh, and we went to Asia. And we were in Asia for about 12 years. And then... The Lord spoke to me in my heart, again, had an impression. It's time to get your master's degree. You're going to finish this. This is in the middle of the Asia time. And Roland's like, what do you think? It's just going to show up in the mail. You're going to have to actually apply and you're going to actually have to get in. And you're going to, have... by then I had really good grades and my brain was healed. And so I apply same university, um, Vanguard University. Back then it was SCC in um, Costa Mesa, California. Uh, been ministering with doing my dance drama. You know, I, I was doing triple pirouettes and leaping across the stage. And then I preached the gospel and thousands of people were coming to the Lord. He used my dance, you know, it was really cool. It was really fun and it was creative and a blast. And I had so much just joy dancing for Jesus, you know. Um, Anyway, the church told me I couldn't, but then I ended up getting set free at that Assemblies of God University. Long story short again, um, I went back and did a master's in leadership and ended up getting straight A's, which I had to have to get into this very, very hoity-toity university. And I was the first woman they ever let in to systematic theology. It's a secular university, University of London. It's very famous in my field and in the world. I apply and I literally get in. It's the wildest thing. And fantastic. when I showed up, they were, pardon? I said, fantastic. That's a wild story. I mean, so I, your story, story is, it, it's striking a couple of bells with me, uh, Heidi. I, I am dyslexic. Um, I was in raised in AG churches, so like there's just a lot of very similar, yeah. The, <laughs> the hero's journey here, I'm resonating with. I really appreciate it. Uh, 
uh, super cool. So, Michael, Andrew, you got a, you got a question really in there? Smart. You're smart, Josh. Well, thank oh, you. Yeah. I appreciate well, it. <laughs> yeah, and I just I think it's beautiful that here you're born to this wealthy family. And you end up in what at the time was the poorest nation in the world and serving amongst the poor. <laughs> the poor. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's a beautiful demonstration of the gospel. Now, uh, you've also talked a lot about your charismatic. I mean, so you've been telling us charismatic experiences. Uh, you've talked about preaching the gospel and God using dance to reach the masses. I also know that he's used healing to reach the masses. I mean, I've seen YouTube videos mm -hmm. and read in your books about you standing up on buses and saying, maybe this was the book, uh, standing up on a bus and saying, bring me your deaf and the deaf come out and they're getting yeah. healed. And and truck. Villages and are truck. getting saved. I have seen a video on YouTube of like a snake charmer or a, or a witch doctor guy with snakes, doctor. vipers all around his arms and <laughs> you lead them to Jesus and crazy story. I read about it in Keener's book. And it, he, le he left a YouTube link. I'm like, I'm watching that. So <laughs> I know that healing and miracles have been a big part of your ministry. Could you just talk about that? Talk about how God has opened up doors for the spreading of the gospel through healing and miracles and casting out demons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, all of us, by the way, every single one of us who loves Jesus, uh, every one of us who's born again, we can all do this stuff. It's just in the book. You know, just read the book. Some people, they, they t say they believe it, but then they read the Gospels and somehow they don't understand. God's not a clockmaker God. He didn't just wind up the world and throw it, throw it away. Um, or he's no longer doing what he did before. He said, these works you shall do, greater works than these you should do. Um, so all of us get to do this stuff. And this is the thing. We, we just see more miracles because we pray for more people. You know, I'm not a special person. I don't consider myself, oh, wow, I'm some healing evangelist. Or No, I'm just a lover of Jesus. I'm a little mama. I, I sit with the poor. I work with the, with the hurting, the broken. Sometimes I do conferences. But it's just like normal stuff. This is like Christianity 101. This is not some extraordinary thing. This is, this is just, it's just living in the Gospels, like doing what Jesus told us to do. And so that's how we live. We just like believe the, the book. We believe the Bible. We believe that it means that we get to do um, what he said we get to do. We don't believe he suddenly stopped doing things. And now we just have to just read the words. No, we get to do this stuff. And so um, the first the first story, I think, is a really good story to tell on, on a the miracle thing. Um, I had prayed for people. I'd seen headaches healed. I'd seen bones healed. And ligaments and backs and things but i had a, a word in a revival that i would see the blind see the deaf hear the cripple walk um the dead be raised and the poor would hear the good news well Amen. i thought that's a powerful testimony i'm i'm excited about that that's a powerful word and so i go back to mozambique after being just absolutely undone i mean i was seven days and seven nights just on the floor just with the heavy weighty glory of god this will this will get your attention jesus said you can do nothing without me i know that he's perfect but then he said you can do nothing without the body of christ i didn't want to hear that part i didn't like all the body of christ i thought you know we serve the poor i was arrogant in my way you know we we serve the poor we live among the poor we work among the poorest people on the planet and some of y'all just eat all the time or talk about it whatever i had stuff god had to rip out of me so he was getting rid of my arrogance things where i didn't understand how much i needed the body of christ how beautiful we all are even with different ideas and different theologies and denominations 
Jesus loves his people. Jesus loves all his whole body. He loves them. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go back to Mozambique, and this prophetic word's going to happen. So I go back. I have this truck. I pull up. Whenever I see blind people, I just pull up my truck, or I'd be on the street doing what I do. I've been ministering on the street for decades, and the garbage dump, and I would just like find blind people, I'd grab them and I'd pray for them, and uh, nobody would see, nobody, not a tiny bit of light, I'd like stick their eyes in the sun, you're not supposed to do this. They would never see anything, not a tiny sliver of light. And um, I would just pray for them, and then I'd lead them to the Lord. They would, not one of them said they didn't want to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I would lead them to the Lord. If they were really hungry, I would feed them, help them. But this went on for a year, a whole year, nothing. This, no deaf hearing, no blind seeing, no cripple walking, surely no dead people getting up. I mean, I literally went to a morgue. I was in there praying for this dead guy. They were tossing baby, dead babies next to me. Um, I prayed for this guy for, for, I don't know, hours, sobbing and crying. One time I thought there was a pulse. It was just my hand making him pulse because I was holding him so long. Um, it, just, it was my pulse I was feeling. But you know what happened, uh, Michael and Josh? The people that were watching this little pale, little blonde lady sobbing over this dead, poor very, very poor, dead Mozambican in rags, when they tried to perturb me with the dead babies. You know what happened is they were so moved by the fact that I just kept praying and, and weeping that they gave their hearts to Jesus. Wow. When it was time for me to leave, they gave their hearts to Jesus. So who's to say what's a greater miracle, you know? Um, but back to the stories that I think you're wanting to not, hear. Not to, not to cut you off, I will go ahead and say the greater miracle of the two is, is the people coming to salvation. Because even though you didn't see the dead come to life, you saw the dead come to life, right? Like, yeah, I like I'll, I'll totally weigh yeah, in. I, I know that's not what you were asking, but yes, it's fantastic. Thanks for weighing in, because yeah. I agree. I love it. I, I, I totally agree. And right now, people will ask me, and I will go back to this blind thing, but... People will ask me, recently they asked me, what's the greatest miracle you've ever seen? I get asked that quite a bit on <laughs> interviews and things. It's like, I don't, you know, I, I have a very clear answer for that. Um, that's extremely clear for me, the greatest miracle I've ever seen. And that is that these guys called Al-Shabaab who torture and behead children and have beheaded our pastors, our friends, four and a half year old um, child was beheaded. Um, hundreds and hundreds of believers, thousands now, a million internally displaced people have lost everything because of a war that you all don't even hear about in Kabul Dogada where we live. And my, my biggest miracle is that God um, put love inside our hearts for these guys, that we're able to forgive them, that the pastors whose children were beheaded um, and who's lost their family members and wives at times and people who were watched them torture, um, friends and loved ones, that they said, no, Jesus forgave us. And so we, we're going to walk in radical love. And we're going to care for these guys. And we're going to see um, what love looks like amongst hell and in the middle of hell. And we're going to walk in grace and mercy for these guys. And um, I think that's the biggest miracle by far that I've ever seen. 
Um, and for me, I, I didn't have love for them. And it was actually at Ascend when my life had been threatened and it was a big um, kidnapping thing going on. And I, I had to leave my country, Mozambique's my country. They have adopted, adopted me. I had to leave for a few months. Um, and I was really not feeling the love for Al-Shabaab, ISIS. I didn't feel any love for them. I, I didn't. I know I needed to, but I didn't feel it in my heart. And it was at Ascend, and, and I heard someone just get up, you need to forgive. And I'm like, I've forgiven my mom. By the way, my father came to, to the Lord and became a minister, was ordained at the age of 72. My mom was born again. She she I was able to cast demons out of my mom. She became a missionary in Mozambique after my dad passed away. That's a beautiful story too. But I was at that meeting and I'm thinking, I've already forgiven my mom. You know, I've already forgiven. I'm going through my little list. He's like, you only have authority where you have love. You only have authority where you have love. Do you love El Shabaab? Do you, do you love these, these guys? And I, I, I was like, no. I was on my face. I was in the right position. I was on my face pillow for hours and hours praying, which is what I do at those big meetings. I just find a spot where I can just pray and worship and not be, you know, talking to everybody, just pray and worship. And um, I was in the right position, but I didn't have the right heart. And the Lord said, well, you want to ask me? For, for this miracle? You want to ask me? I was like, yes. I, I mean, first I, first I smashed my pillow on the ground a few times. Like, no, they, they've tortured. I go through my list of why I don't need this miracle of forgiveness. Why I don't really need to forgive these people that are so, so full of so much mean demonic horror you know why and it, it's like my lists are not he's not interested in my lists you know god's not wanting to hear my list he's just wanting to ask me the question do i want this miracle do i want my heart to feel like his heart feels and i stopped with all my excuses like some of you are wondering, you know, does God heal blind eyes or deaf ears? And the ones that don't believe it probably won't believe it after I share. But if you can hear this story and you can hear our journey and how we're still here, then maybe your heart will just open a little bit to the greatness of the beauty of the mercy of God and what he does and who he is and what he's still doing, and how beautiful it is that as little people, little, little people, I am a little mama. Most of my life's in the dirt. I'm a little mama, and I am the most um, grateful person ah, that God would just stoop so low that he would forgive me that he would save me, that he would love me. And so how could I not want this miracle? So I, I, I gave up and I just started saying, God, please change my heart, change my heart. I want love, I want radical love for these people. And he, he suddenly shifted my, my, um, impression and I was seeing these broken little boys and broken little girls that we picked up on the streets for years and these people like Jose that witch doctor who has just saw him at like a broken little boy not a man come to kill me with the snakes a broken little boy I started seeing Al Shabaab like that like orphans little broken 
guys that are in rags, they're poor, they're powerless, they're desperate, they're angry, they're disempowered. And, and I just felt this overwhelming love for these guys, like the love that Jesus has, the, the love that the Father has, that he wants them to come home. And the Lord changed my heart. Hey! And I went back, and now, um, you know, I was like, it's okay. We got permission after our pastors were literally beat up by friendly fire. Um, horrible stuff with AKs and way more detail I can go into in the time. But because my brothers, the men and the women, my sisters, my brothers that I've been discipling for over 20 years, um, because they, they also learned to forgive. And we all received God's forgiveness for us. And so we just said, Lord, put love in our hearts, love that looks like something, that feels like something, something they can recognize. And we forgave the military police that beat up our guys. They thought they were Al-Shabaab. We got permission to go back in the prison. Um, we take these little audio solar Bibles. They, they're in. We have four or five languages on there. And the guys in prison, the prison was packed with Al Shabab guys, and they gave us permission. It's like I don't feel worthy to go in there. I wasn't beaten that day. I have been beaten. I have been stoned. I have been thrown against walls. I have been. Um, you know, slammed on the internet, but I don't look, so it doesn't hurt me. <laughs> Man, after That's getting stoned, I'll tell you what, getting <laughs> getting slammed uh, on the internet it, feels pretty good, I would imagine. Yeah, I I think uh, I think it's the most cowardly thing of all because you don't even face the people and you just rip people apart. At least people stoning you, you can they can see your eyes. Wow, you know. Anyway, um, that's just something that I think is important to think about. Um, yeah. These yeah, Al Shabab guys came to the Lord. And yes, <laughs> blind eyes have seen, many blind eyes, deaf ears, that's just a sign gift we have. But when I first saw the three blind ladies, they all had my name. And the Lord told me I was the one blind. And that's why. Those three first ladies that I ever saw healed had my name. Their name was Mama Ida. They called me Mama Ida here. And all three of them had my name, and I thought I had a healing ministry. The Lord said, you're blind. And he opened my eyes. That's the miracle. He opened my eyes. And now I can see. And I just, I just want to love more. You think you, you think you know the gospel, and then you listen to a person who shares the gospel with someone who has beheaded their friends, and then it's like, geez, like you, you picture the marriage supper of the lamb, and you've got, you know, the terrorist who is murdering people on one side of the table, and then the people that they've murdered on the other side of the table, sharing in love and fellowship because of what Christ has done. You know, like, uh, yeah, that uh, that's an example. I don't, I don't even know. Like, it, it's a, it's world altering, you know, and it's, you know, our, we, we are so separated from war and here in the West, like here in the States, you know, we've got these things that take place in, in Israel and these things that take place in Ukraine that we're really worried about. And yet all over the world, there's turmoil, there's distress, there's civil wars, people are being murdered, people are being, you know, slain, whether it be uh, race based or religious based, like there's just so much hatred and evil in the world. And it's so hard to conceptualize. I mean, we we have we have Christians here in the West who can't conceptualize uh, brothers and sisters on different political parties. Uh, you're you're asking God to change your heart to think of these people as brothers and sisters that are beheading your friends and family. Um, it is that's a man. That's if there's a takeaway in this interview, I think that's it, man. Um, yeah. But the gospel is is transformative in that way. Amen. And Heidi, you know. The way the way you asked us to to do this, like we're all on the screen, 
uh, made it to where I could not hide the tears that were beginning to stream from my eyes as you spoke. And, you know, this is a theology podcast. You're not supposed to make grown men cry, Heidi. But, yeah, um, Heidi, come on. Party foul. <laughs> Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit did it. Uh, yeah. So. Saint Simeon, the new theologian, uh, said <laughs> tears are a sign of the Holy Spirit's presence. Amen. 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 Well, and I just want to say to those who are watching or listening out there, um, when you hear Heidi Baker, and Heidi, you alluded to people who slander you on the internet, and uh, uh, you know, I heard which, about it. I don't it, you know, know, it happens sometimes. But like, uh, I guess the, the a verse I'm thinking about, it comes from Matthew chapter 11. This will be a little bit of a closing thought because I want to respect your time, Heidi. But um, and we'll also give you a chance to share a closing thought, too. But uh, I think mine would be this is you quoted that, you know, the the crippled will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the poor will have good news preached to them. It comes from Matthew chapter 11, Jesus quoting those words to John the Baptist, which is a compilation of Old Testament promises about the Messiah and his ministry. Um, but then as you zoom down toward the end of the passage, um, Jesus is being criticized and grumbled at and all this. And, uh, you know, the internet trolls are out for Jesus. And, uh, and he says, listen, jo John the Baptist comes, you say he has a demon. I come, you call me a drunkard and a glutton. Essentially, people with this religious critical spirit despise the Holy Spirit, no matter what package he comes in, whether it's the austere ministry of John the Baptist or the uh, very different ministry, like the the party animal Jesus, who's a drunkard and a glut. Like it, just no matter how God comes and visits you, you despise the package no matter what. But then he finishes by saying wisdom is justified by your children. In other words, the spirit expresses himself in many different ways. And uh, sometimes it's going to look like Heidi Baker's ministry. And sometimes it's uh, it's going to look like Sam Storm's ministry. And sometimes it's going to look like this or that. It's going to have a lot of different expressions, but wisdom is justified by our children. In other words, look at the fruit. And I just want to say uh, to the critics of Heidi out there, like, oh, she's a woman preacher. Oh, look at these charismatic excesses mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I just want to say wisdom is justified by our children. Look at the fruit. Um, look at the poor who are being fed. Uh, look at the orphans who now have homes. Look at the churches that are now planted. Look at the uh, deaf ears and blind eyes that are open. And you say, well, I haven't seen those. Well, there's research about it. You can go uh, and look it up. The Glo Global Medical Research Institute went out and actually did the scientific research and validated it. Or go to Mozambique for yourself. But my point is, uh, look at the fruit. And, uh, and Heidi, we're uh, super blessed to just hear the stories of the fruit of the gospel in your life and thankful for the way that God is, uh, is using you. So that, that's my, my closing thoughts it would be to anyone that would, would be critical would be just look at, look at the fruit and we're thankful for the fruit in your life. So, uh, Heidi, what about you? What are, uh, what would be just a closing thought that you would like people to walk away with to sort of, uh, capture the message that you're, you've been trying to, to share today? Uh, I'd like to just end with look at the beautiful body of Christ, that we can do nothing without Jesus. Remember that and remember the beautiful body of Christ that um, I'll end with a story. One day we were in our church and we were having testimony time. We had these two two mamas coming up and one one of them. It's a good story, it's such a good story. It just, it really taught me about so many things. This one lady comes up, she's tiny. She's all tattoos from uh, her culture in, the, in Northern Mozambique. She had old tattoos on her face and she's up there and she said, well, I was gonna eat my family. And the next, I, I was one of the interpreters because at that time we had some visitors there. So I had to interpret into one of the languages. I think it was my turn was into English. I can't remember, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it was into English. Uh, so so she's like, yeah, I was going to eat my family. The, the next guy said, yeah, I was going to eat my family. Now I'm supposed to say, yeah, I'm going to eat my family. And then I'm looking back at the second interpreter like, wait a minute, did, 
did I get that wrong? She was going to do what? Eat my family. And, it, and she, she says it again, I'm going to eat my family, eat my family, eat my family. Then she said, I came into this church oh. and first time she came into the church um, and she said, I just got hugged and I just felt love. She doesn't even know all, all of the full, all of it. She doesn't understand it all theologically. I felt loved. She says something about Jesus. And then, so that's translated again, translated on third third person. I'm, I'm just like, and then she just said, so now I'm not gonna eat my family. So now I'm not gonna eat my family. So now I'm not gonna eat my family. And I was like, whoa, come back. Cause she's, she's trying to leave. I'm like, come back. We'll have a prayer team pray for her. And it turned out she had really, this is um, something, and by the way, Al-Shabaab does stuff like this, and they are orphans, and they need to know Jesus, and they are not, um, they are not uh, adopted until they receive Jesus. We know that, but they are the lost children that he wants to come home. So I want to make that clear, too. They are, they are the lost children that Father wants home. But this, this lady, and someone's got to go get them and reach them and love them. So this lady... This lady is like, she had planned to eat her family because the witch doctors told her to eat her family. The eyes would give her eyes. The heart would give her heart. Whatever she needed, she could divide the body parts out. And But when Jesus came in her heart, she knew immediately, I'm not supposed to eat my family. And I feel like ending this little time, my, my little ending thoughts is for all of you out there um, listening, um, don't eat your family. Don't, don't eat your family. It's time to stop eating your family. Uh, if a little mama could understand that, just, just barely meeting Jesus, then maybe as, as his body of Christ, some of you studied, some of you educated uh, in different fields. I think the Lord wants to really strongly encourage you all to stop eating your family. We are the body of Christ. We don't look alike, sound alike, preach alike, minister alike. We don't have the same personalities or even abilities or, or callings but one thing we are called to love one another and we are called Amen. to love so powerfully that john 17 is manifested on the planet and that people out there can see that we are christians by our love Amen. and if we want al shabaab to know jesus if we want isis to know jesus we want the most broken people out there, um, people with confused identities to know Jesus. How how are they going to know if we're eating each other? Yeah. So let's stop eating our family, and yeah. and let's let's embrace and care for the body of Christ because it's important and it matters to jesus yeah uh, it's like galatians five fifteen, right like not to bite and devour one another that's good heidi thank you so much for coming on the, the show today uh it's such an honor to have you thank you for um inspiring us and being such a good example um I, we know it's christ's work but it's it's nevertheless um it's encouraging it's encouraging to see believers walk in love uh for the lost walk in love for the church um and and display god's gospel uh, both in word and indeed, so we're, we're thankful for you and your ministry. Uh, for those of you who are watching, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that uh, link in the description for the newsletter so you stay in tune uh, with all the different stuff we're doing here at Remnant Radio. Blessings, guys.